elevating the discussion while talking about the things that matter most. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to Society in the State. I'm Brian Hyde. Connor Boyack is taking this episode off. He is on some very important business. Hey, we're very pleased to have Lawrence W. Reed, the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, joining us once again for the podcast. Uh, Larry, you were you were one of our early on guests a little over a year ago when we started this podcast. We just passed the 100 episode mark and uh, just continue moving forward. Thanks so much for making some time to be with us today. Hey, my pleasure, Brian, and congratulations on the anniversary. It's a great pleasure to be with you again. Well, I thought maybe today would be a good day you and I could talk about the seven principles of sound public policy. And one of the reasons I wanted to to bring this up is because I think a lot of people uh, instinctively are going to agree, well, no, no, freedom is good or free markets are good. But when it comes to putting it into practice, it seems like there's a disconnect that sometimes kicks in. And and before we launch into the seven uh, principles of sound public policy, Maybe we could first talk, Larry, why why do we have this disconnect? We have good intentions, but when someone offers us a a type of public policy that perhaps uh, bends or infringes on those principles, we tend to go along with it. Why is that? I think there are several reasons, uh, Brian. Sometimes uh, what's at work is the uh, tyranny of the urgent, uh, where people feel as though, hey, I've got to take a stand on this uh, hot button issue at the moment. And Uh, They don't take the time to remind themselves of their core, fundamental, uh, underlying principles, and and they're swayed by, uh, you know, uh, all the various arguments that come up uh, pertinent to that particular issue at that very moment in time. I think it's so important, though, that we remind ourselves that our policy uh, stances should flow from some core understandings, from some fundamental concepts that we've already thought through and have embraced. Otherwise, we're rather inconsistent in the way we think and behave. No, I, I would agree. I know there are a lot of people who champion, hey, now you've got to keep an open mind. There may be a better way to do this. But but at some point, it would seem that we have enough experience through you know the combined efforts of mankind that um, we'd be safe making a commitment to the truth on some levels. Well, I think so. I mean, you'll you'll always have gray areas. There always uh, will be those occasions for judgment calls. But uh, things really begin to clarify if you hold fast to some core virtues that you know to be right. Well, and one of the things that that I love about the principles that you outlined in this talk, uh, these are not partisan. These are not uh, dependent upon, okay, well, this only works if there's a Republican in this position or a Democrat in this position. These are things that will work regardless of which party may be in power because they, they transcend party. You're exactly right. I've given this talk uh, probably two or three hundred times in many states, many countries. Uh, it's been translated into a great many languages, and it seems to have appeal across the political spectrum because, uh, you know, at the bottom of it all, uh, these are almost indisputable concepts that almost everybody uh, realizes are sort of eternal truths. Larry, if it's okay with you, I will state the principle and then ask you if you would expound on that principle. Does that does that work for you? Yeah, that works fine. All right. Principle one that you mentioned, free people are not equal and equal people are not free. Yes, the kind of equality that I'm talking about in that first principle uh, is not the equality before the law concept that I think everybody readily embraces, the idea that government should be fair and impartial and not discriminatory in the way that it applies its rules. The kind of equality I'm referring to here is economic equality, equality in material wealth uh, or income. And what I'm suggesting here is that when people are free, free to be themselves, free to pursue their dreams, uh, to be the unique individuals that each one of us is, then uh, the outcome in the marketplace isn't going to be the same for all of us. Uh, Because that outcome, and by that I mean, you know, the incomes that we materially earn, that outcome depends upon things like our talents and how uh, willing we are to exert those talents, how quick we are to recognize uh, just what our talents may be, and, uh, uh, you know, our willingness to work, 
uh, our savings rates. I mean, all the things that make us individuals uh, uh, very unique one to another will come into play in the marketplace and will generate different uh, material incomes. But it's the second part of this first principle that I think is even clearer and maybe more compelling. Equal people, and that is again, equal economically, equal people are not going to be free because uh, the only way that you can make people equal economically is if you use force. If you tell them, hey, don't excel, don't be better than somebody else, don't come up with a new idea before other people do, uh, don't be uh, a harder worker, don't do anything that might make you stand out and actually earn more income than, them, than the next guy, because then you have inequality. But of course, who wants to live in a society where you uh, have to force people to be what they're not, equal uh, in terms of uh, their talents, their abilities, and their willingness to work on all these other things. They're not that way in real life. We're not robots. Uh, we are each of us unique, one to another. And so the only way you can create economic equality is if you stifle uh, incentives and the individuality that each of us possesses. I love it. All right, let's move on to the second principle. What belongs to you, you tend to take care of. What belongs to no one or everyone tends to fall into disrepair? Yeah, this is basically an observation about private property. Uh, throughout world history, it's very apparent when you look at the way people behave that uh, they treat things that they can call their own better on balance than they treat things that belong to either other people or nobody or everybody. You know, in places like communist countries, they like to say, uh, oh, we all own this, you know, public property. It's the people's property. Uh, no one person uh, owns this or that thing. But the moment you set up a situation where that's the case, then uh, the property in question no longer will be husbanded or cared for. Everybody will have an incentive to use it and abuse it. And because nobody can call it their own, uh, nobody's going to have a direct and immediate incentive in taking care of it. So if you want to take the scarce resources of any society and quickly trash them uh, and, and reduce the economy to rubble, uh, just take what is uh, private property and make it communal or public property. And then everything becomes a public restroom with everybody using it. And nobody or very few people having any direct incentive to take care of it. No, it's, it sounds like uh, the tragedy of the commons. Yes, it does. Exactly. Uh, anytime you uh, uh, try to uh, take some property and hold it communally in the name of everybody, you simply strip away the incentive of anybody in particular uh, to take care of it. You know, I can, I can see this also applying even in terms of, uh, of a, a person's workmanship. And I'll just throw this in as a quick aside. I had a friend who used to ask young kids when he was teaching them, why do the buildings in socialist countries look so ugly? <laughs> and he showed them, you know, pictures. You know, it, it is it's kind of very drab, very utilitarian often. And, and his explanation was because no one had incentive to create anything of beauty. The, the equality that they enjoyed was, you know, forced on them by government but no one had any incentive to create something different, unique, beautiful. And he says that's the reason why so many of their buildings are just ugly. Yeah, precisely. I think that's a great uh, analogy. All right, principle number three. Sound policy requires that we consider long-run effects in all people, not simply short-run effects and a few people. Yeah, this one is uh, violated every day of the week, <laughs> especially in places like Washington or, or state capitals, any place where uh, government is making decisions. Uh, the tendency, uh, once you uh, socialize something or, or give it over to government, is for people to think of uh, the here and now, what strikes the eye, what gets through the next election, instead of uh, the longer run effects. Uh, of a policy or an act. Uh, this principle really uh, implores us to be thorough in our thinking. If a thief went through uh, a neighborhood grabbing all the cash he could find in people's homes and then went off to the local shopping mall and spent it in one store after another, if you later interviewed the, sh the storekeepers, <clears throat> 
quite a few of them might say, hey, this guy stimulated my business. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I hope he comes back and does that again. <laughs> and if, if you conclude from that that this guy was a public benefactor, that the economy was uh, stimulated by his action, then you're not simply, you're not being thorough in your thinking. You're only looking at what strikes the eye. You're not asking yourself, well, where did the money come from? And isn't it true that the people he took it from have precisely dollar for dollar that much less than what he spent on the things he wanted? He hasn't really stimulated anything on net balance. He simply redistributed what belongs to other people. This uh, this principle reminds me a lot of Bastiat's essay, That Which Is Seen and That Which Is Not Seen. And oh, he, he offers yeah. such a great warning, um, not only to the policymakers, but I, I, I think he offers it to the people who will live under those policymakers, the citizens, that uh, you've got to consider the long-range implications and not just the immediate effect that you hope to see. That's right. He was a master at making this point uh, plain. Uh, not only would he... Uh, say the same thing I just did about uh, the thief going through the mall, but he would say, hey, you've got to consider whether or not this act of stealing and then spending is actually good for the long run, too. Uh, there are a lot of policies that governments can put in place that may seem uh, fine at the moment, and maybe even for a few years or even decades. But what happens if they set into motion certain forces that in the long run uh, may bankrupt the country? And that's nothing to uh, laugh at, because I can think of many civilizations in history that thought, hey, if we just crank up a few new government programs today, we can uh, do a lot of great things. But in the end, they uh, bankrupted themselves once the full long run consequences of what they did uh, were, uh, were realized. Any suggestions before we move on here on, Larry, how can people train themselves to, to think beyond just here and now and, and you know, what, what my immediate need is? How, how do people train themselves to be better uh, prognosticators? Well, think of that example I gave about the thief going through the mall. I find that uh, when I've shared that with audiences, many of them later will tell me, you know, that's, that really stuck with me. And as a result of thinking that way, Every time uh, I'm tempted to embrace some proposal, I ask myself, how is this different from the, uh, the guy who steals somebody's money and then goes and spends it in the shopping mall? Maybe I need to think more thoroughly, think this through, not uh, come to a quick conclusion until I've done so. So I think it's just a matter of reminding yourself that things aren't as simple and uh, quickly uh, analyzed as you might think. Sometimes they require a little deeper thought to come to all the right conclusions. Beautiful. Let's go to principle number four. If you encourage something, you get more of it. If you discourage something, you get less of it. Yeah, this is an observation, uh, Brian, that we are creatures of incentives. All of us as human beings are creatures of incentives. We respond uh, positively to those incentives that are uh, positive or rewarding in nature and uh, to those disincentives that we face, penalties and, uh, and uh, uh, other inhibitions to certain activity, we respond negatively. Uh, if you want to encourage things like, say, uh, work or savings or investment, the things that are important to a growing economy, well, then don't uh, punish and penalize them with public policies that do harm to them. Uh, you know, it, it, for years in America, our welfare policies have rewarded some really bad behavior. We've paid families to break up. Uh, you know, you get more money if the father leaves town. Uh, and so we got break up of families. We shouldn't have been surprised because people were responding to the incentives our policies put in front of them. Uh, you pay them to do bad things, you'll probably get more bad things. If you don't pay them for that, if you say, hey, you have to uh, bear the consequences of your poor judgment, you'll probably get less uh, uh, poor judgments. Well, that makes sense. So subsidize what you want to encourage, tax what you want to discourage, maybe. Uh, well, at least that's better than being completely oblivious. Uh, I, I'm not ready to endorse any particular tax that somebody might suggest. Right, right. But certainly uh, thinking about the incentive effect of every action is a great start in analyzing public policy. I love it. Let's go to principle number five. This one rings so true. Nobody spends someone else's money as carefully as he spends his own. 
<laughs> yeah, this is sort of a restatement of uh, one or two of the earlier principles, but it puts it in a little different uh, context. Uh, if you've heard of um, stories, I've, as I think almost everybody has, of tremendous waste in in government, you you ask yourself time and again, you know, how how does anybody end up spending six hundred dollars for a hammer, or you know, eight hundred dollars for a toilet seat? I mean, those are real life examples. Uh, it's not because they're spending their own money. In fact, you'd be hard put to find anybody who would say, yeah, I'd, I'll spend six hundred for that hammer, uh, if it's their own money. But uh, if it's somebody else's, it changes your behavior. You're just not as careful about it as, uh, as if it were your own. So again, it's a combination here of the incentive principle and uh, the private property principle. So this, this works uh, in government. It works in the private sector. It, it, it really works across the political spectrum. That's just the way we are. Um, don't expect people in government to be spending money that uh, was taken from others as carefully as money that belongs to them personally. If you look at public policy in that light, it certainly raises a lot of questions about uh, a lot of government programs. Boy, does it ever. And and I think this this principle nails the concept that to, when it's someone else's money, especially if you're spending it for somebody else, not on yourself, it's even easier to have that disconnect of, well, you know, I, I'm not really attached to it, so I don't have to be as uh, economical as I as I would be if it was uh, for something for my own interests. Now you yeah. you had mentioned in the in the the speech that you gave um, that uh, a good example of of how that looks was uh, the Michigan Education Association and and how they were spending their union dues um, in, in a very stark contrast to to what what they ostensibly stood for. This is a great story that goes back about 25 years, but its value. Uh, today is is still uh, fantastic. It's just it's just a great uh, lesson. But back in uh, the early 90s, the teachers union in Michigan, where I was employed, uh, I was not employed at the union, but I was employed in Michigan. It made a very public statement opposing any school district contracting competitively with private providers of school support services, things like food service or custodial work or busing or mailing and lots of other things, because the union represented a lot of those kinds of workers too, in addition to teachers, and they didn't want school districts contracting with anybody but their membership, from whom, of course, they were taking uh, forced dues. So uh, at my little think tank at that time, we started uh, giving this some thought, and we realized that, hey, this is this is really... Uh, so anti-efficiency. I mean, why shouldn't the school district have the freedom to contract competitively with a private provider to get these other things done? If they can save some money doing it, then they can put that money to work in the classroom or, or maybe give it back to the taxpayers. Uh, this is self-serving on the part of the union. So we wondered, well, how can we show the public this? And it occurred to us, let's find out what the union does as it, at its own headquarters. And so I sent someone to East Lansing, Michigan, where union headquarters was, uh, with instructions to find out uh, what private firms the union might be contracting with for its own uh, uh, upkeep and services at its headquarters. And lo and behold, we discovered that uh, the teachers union, union was contracting at its own headquarters for all of its food service, its custodial work, its uh, mailing, its security, and some other services. And three out of the four uh, companies that it was contracting with were non-union. Hmm. So <laughs> what it came down to was they were doing at their own headquarters uh, what they were opposing any school district doing with public money. So it really does matter whose money it is that you're spending. Perfect, perfect example. Let's move on to principle six. Government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. And a government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you've got. <laughs> yeah, I think, Brian, that uh, this in some ways is uh, certainly one of the more important of the principles. So many people today seem to think that if it comes from the government, it's sort of free. It, uh, you know, it just uh, comes out of nowhere. But uh, as this principle states, government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody in taxes or from its borrowings which ultimately have to be paid back in tax uh, from taxes 
Or you might say, well, it could always inflate the currency and pay with funny money, which exacts a, a price on all of us, too, in the form of higher prices on everything. So it's not a it's not a magical fairy that uh, produces things out of thin air and then gives it around uh, to people. It, it, it only has what it uh, has to give people what at first is taken from someone else. And there's always a trade off here, too. If it's big enough to give you everything you want, it's at the same time big enough to take away everything you've got. Uh, so it's not only not a, uh, a tooth fairy, it, it also can be a pretty burdensome thing. Uh, the more that it gives away, uh, the more it, ha it has to take uh, just as much from other people. It sounds like it would be a good habit uh, when anybody is proposing something, new policy, new, new law, uh, new something, to always ask the question, at whose expense? As, as part yeah, of the vetting process. That's right. Every time your congressman comes home and says, hey, folks, look what I got for you, instead of saying, hey, thanks a lot, you should be saying, well, how did you get that? Uh, uh, did you have to vote for anybody else's giveaway back in their district in order to get this one? Chances are they had to. So it's like uh, we're all at a big circle with each person's hands in the next guy's pocket. This stuff is not free. Uh, if your congressman got it for you, chances are another congressman's taking some equivalent amount from you. All right, Larry, and let's let's finish on a high note here. This is the seventh principle: liberty makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I think ultimately, Brian, if we forget this principle, none of the others are really going to matter. Uh, Liberty—that is, an environment in which you're uh, free to make your decisions that govern your life so long as you do no harm to others. That's critical. Uh, without it, life is hardly worth living. Can you imagine living in North Korea with just what little we know of what life is like there, where every move is watched and monitored, where you're uh, in a virtual prison, uh, where you're not allowed to start a business, where the government can take your life or throw you in jail at the drop of a hat for no good reason at all? Uh, if we don't understand that liberty is always in danger and must be defended with courage and integrity, then we can find ourselves uh, in a situation where none of these other principles matter because life is just one miserable affair. So uh, not very many people in world history have enjoyed liberty. I think a single digit percentage have. Most people in history have lived as serfs or slaves or at least in constant fear of the powerful guys at the top with political power. So it, it requires courage and integrity. Uh, and if you can muster that and secure liberty and be vigilant in its preservation, then you have a shot at uh, good policy and a good life. I love it. And, and I, I think it just needs to be underscored that it doesn't automatically perpetuate itself. We, we kind of take it for granted sometimes. I think we we take, well, you know, I, I was born into this and, you know, therefore it is my birthright. But somebody has had to do heavy lifting at every step of the way. And, uh, you know, I guess I guess the connection I would ask our listeners to make is we're sometimes the ones who are called on to do that heavy lifting. And it sure is easier when you have some basic principles or pillars of truth that you can lean on as, as guidelines to keep you, you know, on the straight and narrow. That's right. We should always remember what Ben Franklin said as he was leaving the Constitutional Convention uh, of 1787. Apparently a woman came up to him and said, Mr. Franklin, what form of government have you given us? And his famous reply was, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. In other words, we've put some great words on a piece of paper, but uh, time will tell whether you are, are, are of the uh, uh, character and the quality of people to uh, pr preserve and protect uh, the liberties that we've given you. Well, it's, I, I know you see this as an honor to be one of those people who, you know, has the privilege of stepping up and, and helping to perpetuate and educate about liberty. Um, Larry, let's, let's talk for a moment about the Foundation for Economic Education, because I know that people who are serious about it also understand that you can't defend something you yourself don't understand. Tell me about some of the resources available through fee.org that, that can help people become better defenders. I'd be happy to. Every day at fee.org, Brian, we put up uh, anywhere from three to six brand new commentaries. Uh, that Often they are principles focused, uh, timeless, eternal pieces. Other times they may be related to a particular issue that's in the news. 
but that's a, a tremendous wealth of uh, material, easily searchable on our website, going back uh, about 65 years, believe it or not. Uh, uh, we've archived all of our content since we first began producing it uh, so many decades ago. But also on our website, we have uh, 17 or 18 free downloadable courses for teachers, for students. Uh, if you go to fee.org slash courses, you'll find uh, a, a curriculum related to the economics of entrepreneurship, uh, you know, how to start a business. I mean, you name it, it's all there. Uh, and that uh, uh, roster of courses will continue to grow. We also have lots of video. We're producing uh, a couple or three new short videos every month. And if you go to the events page at fee.org, you'll see that uh, we are constantly hosting seminars and individual presentations all over the country and beyond. And I would recommend anybody who has the chance to attend should really find a way to do this. You, you will become a more effective defender of freedom um, thanks to, to the tools uh, provided by fee.org. Larry Reed, thank you so much for being on Society in the State. It's been a real honor to get to visit with you. Hey, my pleasure, Brian. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com.